magical thing to read to you in times like this. It reminds us of the power of the words. It reminds us also of how ingenious we can be transporting images all over the world and talking to each other even when we are not allowed to be in one room together. So my publishers asked me to read a little bit from Inkart for you. Rain fell that night. A fine whispering rain. Many years later Maggie had only to close her eyes and she could still hear it, like tiny fingers tapping on the window pane. A dog barked somewhere in the darkness and however often she tossed and turned, Maggie couldn't get to sleep. The book she had been reading was under her pillow, pressing its cover against her ear, as if to lure her back into its printed pages. I'm sure it must be very comfortable sleeping with a hard, rectangular thing like that under your head, her father had teased, the first time he found a book under her pillow. Go on, admit it. The book whispers its story to you at night. Sometimes, yes, Maggie had said, but it only works for children. Which made Mo tweak her nose. Mo, Maggie had never called her father anything else. That night, when so much began and so many things changed forever, Maggie had one of her favorite books under her pillow. And since the rain wouldn't let her sleep, she sat up, rubbed the drowsiness from her eyes, and took it out. Its pages rustled promisingly when she opened it. Maggie thought the first whisper sounded like a little different from one book to another, depending on whether or not she already knew the story it was going to tell her. But she needed light. She had a box of matches hidden in the drawer of her bedside table. Mo had forbidden her to light candles at night. He didn't like fire. Fire devours books, he always said. But she was 12 years old. She could surely be trusted to keep an eye on a couple of candle flames. Maggie loved to read by candlelight. She had five candlesticks on the windowsill and she was just holding the lighted match to one of the black wicks when she heard footsteps outside. She blew out the match in alarm. Oh, how well she remembered it, even many years later. And held to look out of the window, which was wet with rain, and she saw him. The rain cast a kind of pallor on the darkness and the stranger was little more than a shadow. Only his face gleamed white as he looked up at Maggie. His hair clung to his wet forehead. The rain was falling on him, but he ignored it. He stood there motionless, arms crossed over his chest, as if that might at least warm him a little. And he kept on staring at the house. I must go and wait more, thought Maggie. But she stayed put, her heart thudding, and went on gazing out into the night as if the stranger's stillness had infected her. Suddenly, he turned his head and Maggie felt as if he were looking straight into her eyes. She shot off the bed so fast the open book fell to the floor and she ran barefoot out into the dark corridor. This was the end of May, but it was chilly in the old house. There was still a light on in Mo's room. He often stayed up reading late into the night. Maggie had inherited her love of books from her father. When she took refuge from a bad dream with him, nothing could lull her to sleep better than Mo's calm breathing beside her and the sound of the pages turning. Nothing chased nightmares away faster than the rustle of printed paper. But the figure outside the house was no dream. The book Ma was reading that night was bound in pale blue linen. Later, Maggie remembered that too. What unimportant little details stick in the memory. Ma, there's someone out in the yard. Her father raised his head and looked at her with the usual absent expression he wore when she interrupted his reading. It always took him a few moments to find his way out of that other world, the labyrinth of printed letters. Someone out in the yard. Are you sure? Yes! He's staring at our house. 
Mo put down his book. So what were you reading before you went to sleep, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Maggie frowned. Please, Mo, come and look. He didn't believe her, but he went away anyway. Maggie tugged him along the corridor so impatiently that he stubbed his toe on a pile of books, which was hardly surprising. Stacks of books were piled high all over the house, not just arranged in neat rows on bookshelves the way other people kept them. No. The books in Mo and Maggie's house were stacked under tables, on chairs and the corners of the rooms. There were books in the kitchen and books in the lavatory, books on the TV set and in the wardrobe, small piles of books, tall piles of books, books thick and thin, books old and new. They welcomed Maggie down to breakfast with invitingly open pages. They kept boredom at bay when the weather was bad, and sometimes you fell over them. He's just standing there, whispered Maggie, leading Mo into her room. Has he got a hairy face? If so, he could be a werewolf. Oh, stop it! Maggie looked at him sternly, although his jokes made her feel less scared. Already she hardly believed any more in the figure standing in the rain, until she knelt down again at the window. There! Do you see him? She whispered. Mo looked out through the raindrops running down the pane and said nothing. Didn't you promise burglars would never break into a house because there's nothing here to steal? Whispered Maggie. He's not a burglar, replied Mo. But as he stepped back from the window, his face was so grave that Maggie's heart thudded faster than ever. Go back to bed, Maggie, he said. This visitor has come to see me. He left the room before Maggie could ask what kind of visitor, for goodness sake, turned up in the middle of the night. She followed him anxiously. As she crept down the corridor, she heard her father taking the chain of the front door. And when she reached the hall, she saw him standing in the open doorway. The night came in, dark and damp, and the rushing of the rain sounded loud and threatening. Dust finger? Caught Mo into the darkness. Is that you? Dust finger. What kind of name was that? Maggie couldn't remember ever hearing it before, yet it sounded familiar, like a distant memory that wouldn't take shape properly. At first all seemed still outside except for the rain falling, murmuring as if the night had found its voice. But then footsteps approached the house and the man emerged from the darkness of the yard, his long coat so wet with rain that it clung to his legs. For a split second, as the stranger stepped into the light spilling out of the house, Maggie thought she saw a small furry head over his shoulder, snuffling as it looked out of his rucksack and then quickly disappearing back into it. Dustfinger wiped his wet face with his sleeve and offered Mo his hand. How are you, Silver Tongue? He asked. It's been a long time. Hesitantly, Mo took the outstretched hand. A very long time, he said, looking past his visitor as if he expected to see another figure emerge from the night. Come in, you'll catch your death. Maggie says you've been standing out there for some time. Maggie? Ah, yes, of course. Dustfinger let Mo lead him into the house. He scrutinized Maggie so thoroughly that she felt quite embarrassed and didn't know where to look. In the end, she just stared back. She's grown. You remember her? Of course. Maggie noticed that Mo double locked his door. How old is she? Dustfinger smiled at her. It was a strange smile. Maggie couldn't decide whether it was mocking, supercilious, or just awkward. She didn't smile back. Twelve, said Mo. Twelve, my word. Dustfinger pushed his dripping hair back from his forehead. It reached almost to his shoulders. Maggie wondered what colour it was when it was dry. The stub around his narrow-lipped mouth was gingery, like the fur of the stray cat Maggie sometimes fed with a saucer of milk outside the door. 
ginger hair sprouted on his cheeks too, sparse as a boy's first beard, but not long enough to hide three long pale scars. They made Dustfinger's face look as if it had been smashed and stuck back together again. Twelve, he repeated. Of course. She was, uh, let's see, she was three then, wasn't she? Mo nodded. Come on, I'll find you some dry clothes. Impatiently, as if he were suddenly in a hurry to hide the man from Maggie, he led his visitor across the hall. And Maggie, he said over his shoulder, you go back to sleep. Then without another word, he closed his workshop door. Maggie stood there rubbing her cold feet together. Go back to sleep. Sometimes when they'd stayed up late yet again, Mo would toss her down on her bed like a bed of walnuts. Sometimes he chased her around the house after supper until she escaped into her room, breathless with laughter. And sometimes he was so tired, he lay down on the sofa and she made him a cup of coffee before she went to bed. But he had never, ever sent her off to her room so brusquely. A foreboding, clammy and fearful, came into her heart as if along with a visitor whose name was so strange, yet somehow familiar, some menace had slipped into her life. And she wished so hard it frightened her that she had never fetched Mo, and Dustwing had stayed outside until the rain washed him away. These words were, in some way, written by me because I wrote the story, but I wrote it in German. So what you heard are also the words of the wonderful late Anthea Bell, who was my magical translator. Sending love to you all.